at the end of the day, to run a podcast is like running any other business. You've got to show up every time that you want to create a podcast, be consistent, and also ensure that you've got the passion behind it. Welcome back to the Talking Web Marketing Podcast with myself, Ilana Wexler. This is a show where we reveal the best tips, tricks, and tactics to increasing your website traffic and then converting that traffic into leads and sales. We also discuss what's working right now in the ever-changing world of web marketing so you can apply it to your business. All right, welcome to today's episode of Talking Web Marketing. I've got a really exciting guest for you all today, a guy under the name of Tyrone Shum, who has built a brand new podcast from zero to over 100,000 downloads in a ridiculously short amount of time. I believe it's six months. Is that Tyrone? Yes, that's right. So welcome to today's show. Thank you so much for being one of our first ever guests. It's an honor to have you on. Oh, thank you, Alana. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Great. So, although your podcast is brand new, you're not new to the world of web marketing. So, by way of, I guess, introduction into your expertise and your background, do you mind just going through briefly some of the interesting ventures that you've done in the past? Because I know you've done lots of interesting things. (laughs) I didn't realize I was that interesting. (laughs) You are. Everyone's interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Alana. Awesome. Well, so I I started a podcast just recently, about six months ago, in property, uh, the niche property, and I've always had a passion in property since a quite a young age, and it kind of stemmed it back from when my my parents bought property and uh, sold it, and then made quite a bit of money from it. And I thought, wow, you know, if, if they can do it, and I see that the very very wealthy, the people who have uh, an enormous amount of wealth in Australia own property as being the, the key to wealth. And I thought, if I can learn from these people, I think I could also replicate and do the same thing. And what I discovered was um, there was a lot of great podcasts out there who were talking about property, but unfortunately, they were just talking about the how-to rather than just the story. And because I come from a background where I have implemented and created scripts and, and stories behind videos and done a bit of other podcasting in different niches, I saw that was a missing niche and I decided, okay, if no one else is doing it, I thought I'd do it because I was trying to scratch my own itch. I was getting through their podcasts that were were publicized weekly and only once a week they had it because I was driving to work about half an hour a day. I was getting through their podcasts within about a month and I was like, I want more podcasts. So I decided to myself, all right, if I'm committed and I'm willing to do something like that, I'll go out and and find as many property investors and start interviewing them just for my own sake and wanting to learn and start sharing that and and try and publish a podcast that's happening every second day. And since then, it's just been phenomenal. and That's how it started. But going back to to where I initially started, I have been in in the internet marketing uh, industry and also digital marketing industry for the last close to about 10 years. And um, Amazing. Yeah, seven out of the 10 of them have been within, say, video marketing, podcasting, outsourcing, and uh, various forms of, of search engine optimization as well. And I guess I'm not new really to the industry. I've been in the industry for quite a while, but I'm, I'm taking my skill set and stuff into a different niche altogether. So that's my background in a summary. I love that you've used your past experience and are just applying it to a different industry. And that just shows, I guess, the endless opportunities that when you sort of learn the basic digital marketing skills, you can really apply it to a bricks and mortar business or industry like like property, which is amazing. So that's amazing. Well done. Thank you. And this is the thing. I, I used to run a digital slash agency type of business where I did consult with small businesses and help them apply and also increase their traffic to their websites through different forms, such as uh, video marketing, podcast marketing as well, and also uh, SEO rankings as well. And just from, from seeing all that, it, everything that, that we do, everything that I've done in the past, it all comes back down to fundamentals. And that's really serving and finding the client's pain points and really trying to address that and, and, and just try and solve their problems online. That's really all it comes back down to when, when you look at the foundation of it. It's pretty simple, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, this is. Awesome. All right. So let's get stuck into more information about your new podcast, which tell me the name again of it. Sure. It's called Property Investory. Investory. So it's basically two words that I've, I've, or three words I actually came up with. As it's stories about property investors, I thought, why not call it Property Investor Stories? And I thought, gosh, that's getting a bit long. 
<laughs> so what I discovered when I combined property investor by adding a Y at the end, it was actually a merge of the word story into property investory. And that's how the word came about. I love it. It's just a pl- play on words. That's great. So I guess you've already touched on to one of the reasons why you decided to launch one really for your own information and thirst for knowledge. Were there any other reasons why you decided to, um, to launch one? Because it's quite a commitment. It is. It's, it is a huge commitment. Uh, I guess my goal for this podcast is to inspire millions of people, firstly to invest into property and build a community behind it. And then from there is to be able to create a, a private community of people subscribing to a membership program and to really collaborate and have experts come into play and obviously to monetize this in some shape or form. So there'll be potentially ways for me to monetize it, such as sponsorship, such as people signing up to a membership site to share content and also to network because at the end of the day, property is about people and there's so many different ways that you can actually invest into property, whether it be doing joint ventures with other people or searching for resources to be able to help invest into property. Yeah, there's just so many different ways to look at it and um, it all comes back down to building that community and knowing who, finding the right people to trust and to get their assistance and advice and expert help to guide you along the way and also potentially help you through some form of service. Yeah. I guess the opportunities really are quite endless as you've outlined the sponsorships and JVs and community and it's um, opening up a world of possibility for you. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. I mean, I didn't know a lot about this stuff before when I first started. I just thought, you know, the best way to learn is to ask. And since asking that many people, I've had over 100 people who interviewed. And I think the key thing that I've learned from this is a lot of them share some really, really invaluable gems. And if you take away just a little bit of each person's advice and and expert tips that they share with you, it can really, really go a long way. And yeah, it's just been phenomenal because these people who I look up to when when I've read their books, I've spoken to a lot of people in the industry and they, they all also admire them and look at them as experts. They're just so generous with their time. I've been so, so grateful and had a lot of great influence from them. So it's, it's just been an absolutely amazing journey for me. That's great. So <clears throat> if you've never started a podcast before, how would you go about starting one? Like what are the, what's the starting point for somebody who's, I guess, interested in potentially undertaking like a similar journey like yours? How would they go about starting one? <laughs> is, is that a simple say- question or...? <laughs> or not? I was going to say, don't do what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the reason why is because you really have to be committed because yeah. at the end of the day, to run a podcast is like running any other business. You've got to show up every time that you want to create a podcast, be consistent and also ensure that you've got the passion behind it. Because even when you reach to say the 10th podcast, the 100th podcast, and you're not getting any people listening to your podcast, you've still got to be persistent because if you want to succeed, You've got to be able to show that there is passion and drive behind it. Yeah. Like when I first started this podcast, I was getting a bit concerned when my numbers were quite low because I started off with about averaging about 5,000 downloads in the first month. And I thought, oh, that's, that's not too many. But as, as it started growing and exponentially growing, the way I, I've seen it grow now, it's, it's put a lot more uh, motivation. It confirms everything I do because not only that, I'm, I'm getting a lot of great comments, emails from all the listeners and, and people even subscribing by a different type of technology, not just through email, but other forms that I'm offering for them, which I'll, I'll share with you down a little bit later on this episode. But um, I'm, I'm getting so much feedback that it inspires me to continue to push through because there are going to be days where you go, gosh, I'm so tired of interviewing, you know, five or six interviews in a row. Like, why am I doing wow. this? What's the reason behind it? So, I mean, I, I just got off uh, two interviews, two hours straight of interviews just now and hopping onto this podcast now with you. And um, I I always go, okay, I'm I'm really doing it at the end of the day for the listeners because I want to inspire them. And at the same time, it will inspire me as well. But I've got to make sure that I have the right message and also the the actual heart that's involved in this and ensure that um, it's doing it for them as a community. So you got to ask yourself, is this something that you definitely want to do for the rest of your life or or for at least a, a medium to long term? And you've got to ask yourself, the other questions is, you know, how are you going to monetize this? Because at the end of the day, some people can do this for passion, but, you know, if you're using this as your full-time income or you're going to be committing this to actually grow something else, you've got to figure out how you're going to monetize a podcast like this. So definitely ask those questions at the beginning. In terms of starting out, where to start and how to go about it, this is not my first podcast, by the way. This is probably my third podcast I've done in my life. 
the first that podcast. I didn't know. I thought this was your first. No, <laughs> this is my third podcast. I'll, I'll share with you the, the two previous podcasts I did. The, the first podcast I did was all about internet marketing and interviewing all the successful people, just like what other, a lot of other um, successful entrepreneurs would do out there. It's just, you know, got, I got into that bandwagon thinking, okay, I could interview a lot of successful business owners and share their story. That worked out really well because I got some really, really top bloggers and, and great people on like Chris Brogan, Darren Rouse, you know, James Franco, so forth on to my podcast. And that took off really well. That's where I, I learned the art of interviewing. I didn't mm. realize how yeah, interesting it was. Yeah, it's a skill that you had to learn. And for me, as, as my personality is more like, okay, I would rather just sit there and, and listen and learn rather than actually talk in a podcast for a whole hour. That's the reason why I, I tend it towards to lean towards interviewing people and actually getting their knowledge because they're providing the content. And I guess that's where I learned the skill of being able to ask the right questions and, and to create the right storylines behind it. And as time evolved, I, I got better and better at it. Then I delved myself into a little bit about video marketing. Nice. <laughs> and and that's, that's where I started learning a lot about creating stories and scripts and, and, and then trying to engage the audience in some shape or form because there are so many videos out there. Like I, I've heard that there's literally 100 minutes worth or, or actually 100 hours worth of video being uploaded literally every minute or something like that, some ridiculous amount. And you've got to be able to captivate your audience. So from that skill set that I've learned, I launched another podcast, which was focused on video marketing. And uh, that one did really well as well too. That, that took off and started ranking in the top space of, of video marketing. But I, I realized after a period of time doing that one, I kind of was lost a bit of passion because you go, okay, you, you talk about the basics of video, <laughs> what do you talk about next? <laughs> so that, that kind of fizzled out, but um, I did take away a lot of great skills from that and applying that knowledge to this podcast here, it was able to, to help me to get to where I am right now. So to really answer the question is why you should start a podcast and, and how you should go about it is to really ask what is really going to be your passion for the long term. That, that's what I see as being a key factor. And two, see if, if you want to be behind the mic and talk about the topic that you're passionate about or interview people, or you can have a hybrid of both and mm -hmm. um, just see what, what works best for you and I guess go from there. That's, that's really the best recommendation I can give for you from personal experience. So your past two podcasts that you were just talking about, are they still going or you've stopped doing them? Yeah, I stopped doing them a while ago because I, I think I, I focused my time when I was actually running those businesses as well on actually servicing and promote, uh, providing services for my, my clients, which are small business owners. And that took up a lot of time because obviously, yeah, running, running a business and managing clients and stuff like that does take... Yes. A lot more energy out of you. And um, yeah, I think where the dollars were coming in and where I monetized, they obviously were through service-based business and the podcast wasn't monetizing as much as I thought it would. So I guess I put that on hold and, and yeah, lo and behold, I end up <laughs> running another podcast, which I'm passionate about. <laughs> and uh, I, know, I know this time around, I put a clear strategy in place on how I'm going to monetize it. So yeah. lessons to be learned over the time that I've done all these in the last 10 years and yeah, this is kind of the, the end product of, well, not really end, but the next product phase in my life. I like it. So <laughs> how do you go about getting guests onto your show? Is that, is that <laughs> so a challenge? It is a challenge. It's, it's persistence. So really? this, this is what I, I initially did because I, I knew a few of the guests, or actually I should say experts in the industry because I've read their books and I, I've seen them in magazines and stuff like that. And knowingly, I, I tried my best to try and reach out to them, which you know, everyone tries to do when, when they're starting out. But the thing is, there's not much credibility behind what I was doing. So a lot of them basically said no. And um, I guess from, from the start, I had to sort of build those relationships up. So luckily, I had some previous contacts um, when I was doing mentoring through a program called Results Mentoring, which was also initially owned by Steve McKnight, which is a very well-known property expert. He wrote the book Zero to 130 Properties in three and a half years. Wow. And that was an amazing story. And I was part of his mentoring coaching. And um, through a period of time, because he knows me and I've, I've met him many times and worked together before, he agreed to do an interview. But that one took about three months to actually get him on the call because there's a lot of back and forth. But he, he was more than willing to come on because he, he's, yeah, he's always been so, so willing to have a chat and, and share his knowledge. So by having him agree and say that he was on, coming on the podcast, it kind of put a bit of credibility. But not only that, I also did have a few other people like Brendan Kelly, who also was a mentor working with him, but he also runs the business of results. Had John Linderman, who's a market researcher. He also 
knows Brendan. So it's just through that small little network, it kind of expanded and I just... It was like momentum, hinted, really. Yeah, momentum. I can't kind of keep name hinting to these people. But obviously, to get all these experts on takes a bit of time. So what I did was I thought I'd reach out to smaller people and I, I decided, okay, there are a few publications in this industry, such as Australian Property Magazine and Your Investment Magazine. And I think back then they did have Smart Property Investment, but they closed that publication down because obviously publications right now print are quite costly to run. So what I did was I firstly went over to the library, actually, of all places, to get all the back issues of the Australian Property Investor Magazine. And I just would start going through finding amazing stories of people who have succeeded in property investing and just start knowing their names down and then just did some research online and basically reached out to them because they weren't So old school of you. Yeah, very old school. <laughs> it worked. And I managed to get quite a lot of investors who, you know, they're not experts, but they've got some amazing stories to share. So that kind of is where I started. And then I also jumped onto other podcasts and sort of, you can say, you know, saw what other stories they're doing and started reaching out to them and say, look, by the way, I saw you featured on so-and-so. Would you love to come on my podcast? And a lot of them just agreed and that's where it started. And then just from there, just built up a huge list of guests on the show. And now I'm about two to three months ahead of schedule and it's been fantastic. So wow. I don't have to really go out to look, find as many guests as I used to, but I'm still, yeah, still just trying to churn them through or get them in. Maybe soon people will start approaching you to appear on your show. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually it's, it has been, that's, that's what's been happening. I'm wow. trying to manage this as best as I can. So I've had numerous people will contact and, and yeah, I've just had to say them, well, it's at least two or three weeks wait before you can get hold of me for the next interviews. So it's been great you know, in, that, in that sense. Yeah, amazing. So I guess the question that I think a lot of people would be wondering about now is how have you built it up in such as, you know, to so many downloads and, and a listenership in such a short space of time? Have you got kind of any tips or tricks or strategies that you could give somebody who, let's say, has a podcast and they're really trying to increase and expand their listenership, how they could get mm -hmm. some more momentum with that. For sure. I think there's been a number of factors. I think the ma major two contributing factors that I can definitely say is the first one is to build those relationships with your guests, especially the experts in the industry because they have quite a substantial influence on the market and also potentially has quite a number of um, subscribers either through their email list and also on their social media. Mm -hmm. And because what I did was the first eight that I released were actually expert interviews of well-known people in the industry, I asked them to see if they'd be willing to support the campaign to actually promote it to their list. So that's kind of where it helped launch the podcast initially by putting eight of them out there and then consistently posting for a few days consistently. I think what I did was I did one every day for about four weeks or so. And then I, I switched the schedule up to do it every second day since then. Wow. But by doing that, that drove the momentum to actually drive the, the initial downloads down because obviously you need to get it spread out and, and try to get as many people to listen in order for this to actually start to grow and, 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 and yeah, impact a lot more people. So that, that's really how it started. But to be honest, you've just also got to put things in perspective because the other question you've got to ask yourself, the experts will probably ask you, is why should I promote you know, your podcast to my list and you've got to give them a strong enough reason why. And it's not only because of self-promotion, but also to that your podcast is unique compared to the rest. And the reason why my podcast stood out from the rest of the market is because it's it's very much well narrated and also to it's it's got something that's really different. So I, I want to sort of give away exactly how my podcast sounds. Just hop on, you know, have a listen to it and you'll sort of get a better idea behind it. So then the experience it for yourself, what the difference is between just a normal interview that we have out there. So that's probably one of the major key factors that drove the success of the downloads. But not only that, it was consistency of actually posting, posting continuously with more and more interviews and sharing those stories with as many people as possible. And over time, as you start posting more, iTunes picks that up and starts pushing up your ranking. And then that leads on to my next part, which basically means that you've just got to make sure that when you're actually posting your content out there, that it's going to be optimized for iTunes. And when I say optimized, try to target the keywords that people are searching for because you can put it out a very great catchy headline, but at the end of the day, there's no keywords related to the topic. People are not going to find it because it's very old school. It's not like iTunes is nowhere near like how Google is where Google you know, can sort of have predictive words that they can go, okay, Maybe let's just take, for example, as I'm talking about property, how to do renovations on your next house. If you just type in property, no one's going to be able to find 
that particular topic because it's related to renovations. Whereas in Google, they've got suggested searches like renovation property, renovation houses, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. iTunes doesn't have that, unfortunately. So you've just got to be very clear with what you put into your titles and your headlines that it has specific keywords. And on top of that, your podcast needs to ensure that it has very, very specific keywords into it. So if you saw my podcast, you just probably think that my podcast has a lot of keywords in it and and it's intentional for that reason and not just by putting the actual title of my podcast, which is Property Investory. So I've got like, for example, Australian Property Investor as keywords. I've got um, Property Investment as another keyword. I've got Rent Vesting as another keyword in my title. And those have actually helped boost my rankings up into iTunes in order for people to find it. So those are some of the little key tips that, that I've learned over the way throughout my journey because it's not just about creating content and then posting and praying and hoping that someone will find it and it'll rank. You actually need to do some serious work behind the scenes to actually get it to where it needs to be. So not the spray and pray method. <laughs> yes, definitely not. <laughs> so going back to your the keyword selection issue, like let's say you've got, I mean, how do you go about discovering what keywords to use? Mm, it's a really, really good question. And this is something I pondered over for quite some time. So for the listeners out there, this will probably be an awesome tip because it'll save you hours of work and research. In iTunes, if you go and have a look at, say, if you want to say comparing your maybe competitors or partners on iTunes, depending on whichever niche you're in. So in my niche, it's property. I did a property search for that particular keyword and a lot of different podcasts came up and some podcasts, I'll give you some examples. It's like smart property investment or the property couch or rent vesting or everyday property investing. They have been on the market and posting, I think, yeah, posting and sharing their their audio since like 2014 from memory, 2014, 2015. So it's been a good three or four years. And obviously over time, they've built up a lot of content. So what I did was I hopped into a lot of the episodes and started to see what kind of titles they used and then start formulating and getting some ideas from that. So that's one way of trying to find out what kind of keywords they're using because more than likely, you'll see that a lot of these podcasts have been ranking inside iTunes are definitely coming from these top guys. Um, So so that's quick question on that though. Are Are you saying that the keywords at an episode level are different to the keywords for your podcast? Yes, that's right. Okay. Exactly right. So so if you look at all the episodes that they've published, you'll start to sort of see some titles in there and then you'll start to find some keywords that are quite common. Like on the Rent Vesting podcast, they commonly use the word rent vesting. So it's obviously a heavily searched keyword term that's been used on iTunes. And if you put that somewhere within your episodes and your titles of your podcast, there's a good chance that you could rank for that. So that, that's how I kind of found some of the keywords. And the other way to do it is, this, this is usually when you're logging onto a desktop and you log into iTunes. When you go into the iTunes store, specifically under the podcast section, there is a search bar in the top right-hand corner. I don't know if they're ever going to change that location, but you know, for the current date in 2017, mm-hmm. the search bar is always on the top right-hand corner. And what you do is you just type in the search bar a particular topic that is related to your niche. So you could type in renovations, for example. And what will happen is that they'll have a suggestive amount of searches listed straight below it. Just like how in Google, when you go to Google and type in renovations, they'll show potential words that are related to renovations. iTunes has that option in their search bar. And if you have that drop down, it'll say to you, you know, renovations for homes. They are your potential golden keywords because uh, those are the keywords that people are searching on iTunes. And that's, that's a great that's been, tip. Mm, so that's been one another powerful way for me to be able to find out what keywords people are using and how to rank for them too. Amazing. So would you say that you need a minimum number of episodes before you launch? Like, I guess, you know, a lot of people talk about getting in the new and noteworthy section. Were you sort of mindful of how many episodes you wanted to have ready to go live at launch? I did. And I I read a lot of success stories online on podcasting. There was a few from like Nathan Latka. There was also one from a Jim, I can't remember his actually last name, but another guy called Jim who wrote a very um, detailed post about how they've succeeded and downloaded. They got on the new and noteworthy and plus some of them had reached a million downloads in a very short period of time, you know, that kind of stuff. And I did sort of go, okay, see how they, how they would actually launch their podcast because I was in that phase and I, I sort of modeled off them. But to be honest, there's not really, uh, I mean, a, a perfect number there because that's what I've discovered. 
I decided to follow what Nathan did, which was to launch eight episodes in the first day, just to see if I can get a lot more leverage and downloads and stuff like that. And that, that did work to a certain extent, and it sort of leveraged off from there. But what I felt that worked really well was the subsequent days and the subsequent weeks, because it's not just the first day of launch, it's actually the few weeks after that, that's when you actually start seeing the numbers increase. A lot of people out there talk about launching with at least three episodes, and you can do that. But I, I personally went with eight, and that seemed to work for me. But what I was trying to do as well was, and I thought that this strategy would work, was to try and get as many downloads to try and get listed on the new and noteworthy. But after discovering that the new and noteworthy is not based on how many downloads you have, it's based on people picking it, like actual people from uh, iTunes inside Apple will see your podcast and, and, and pick it and then put it there. That's how that actually gets ranked. So it's, it's hand-picked nowadays, not actually driven by a formula or anything like that. And really to get onto that, I think you just have to contact them, which I've done at least three times by sending an email to them and they've given me a, a list of questions and I've answered them correctly, but I still haven't got onto new or noteworthy. So it, it, they're quite picky on, on how it goes about and, and to get launched on the new or noteworthy. So I still haven't cracked that one, to be honest. But. Maybe for your next <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'll, cool. probably re- I'll probably revisit that uh, shortly and, and have a crack at it again, see what happens. Because I suspect this won't be your last podcast that you do. Oh, uh, maybe. I don't Who know. Knows? See. We'll see. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> we won't make such speculation. <laughs> not, not right now. <laughs> All righty. So let's wrap up. I think we've, I've, I've taken up already plenty of your time and I'm, I'm mindful of your time. So I guess a handful of action steps for people who are looking to increase their listenership. You mentioned building the relationships, but I guess what, what would be your number one tip for people who are really trying to grow their podcast to a level like you've got in such a short period of time? I, I think what's been key for me is definitely relationships, as I mentioned, but also building up that email database as well and, and try and get people to subscribe to that because what's key is to actually drive those subscribers back onto iTunes to subscribe because what happens is in order for you to rank really well is iTunes looks at not only the number of downloads but they also look at the number of subscribers in the first I think it's 90 days wow. don't quote me exactly the details on that but I did hear on another podcast based on that lip sync they share the specific stats and the, the actual formula behind on how that works but what's key and that's crucial is to ensure that you get a lot of subscribers within the first 90 days for you to actually get your, your podcast ranked quite high. So my, my recommendation to you is to have very strong call to actions in your podcast to get people firstly to subscribe to your database, yep. whether it be on your website or whether it be you know, on a phone, which is what I've actually been doing. I've been promoting a number that they can SMS to and send their emails to. And then really? we get on Mali. Yeah, yeah, and then that's that's been working, and um, yeah, that people just, people are just what's the word for it? Uh, time constrained because everyone's busy, and not everyone remembers exactly to hop onto the website after the podcast. Because more than likely, people are either going on a run with their mobile in the car, listening on the drive. They're they're all busy moving, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they would have time to just hop onto the website. So most people actually text quite frequently. So. If you can provide them an easy number for them to text, like a memorable number, it's quite easy for them to just open up Messenger and just text the email to you and then basically just add that to your list. And that, that's been working effectively for, for me so far. And um, yeah, Amazing. just very strong call to actions at, at, at the middle of the, the episodes, which is what I've been doing, or at the end. And that's been really powerful to actually get people to, to take some form of action. And then from there, provide as much great content as you can because it's it's the offer that's going to help you to actually drive them back to your website, that's most important. And then from there to be able to nurture them, engage with them and, and reply to as many inquiries as you can. Because, you know, since I, I launched the podcast, I've had a lot of people inquiring and I guess it's that's how you build engagement. And then when they are by great feedback, ensure that you ask them to try and leave you a review as well. Yeah, it just kind of flows basically. And it's just a roll-on effect and just keeps helps you grow, really. That's, yeah. that's the way I've done it. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Well, where can people find out more about this amazing podcast that you're doing? Thank you, Alana. So all you have to do is just simply go to Property Investory. So it's just the word property and then investor with the letter Y at the end. And just go to propertyinvestory.com. You feel free to subscribe to the free case studies that we give away there. And also you can subscribe to us on iTunes or Android devices or anywhere where you want to download it. We're pretty much on every single platform that's available. So you should be able to find us quite easily by doing that. And that's awesome. how you can get reach, reach us. 
Alternatively, if you do want to actually um, contact me via mobile, I can give you our direct mobile here, 0499881040. Nice. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy day to come and chat to me. I really appreciate it and you've provided a ton of value for our listeners. So thank you and um, I will chat to you next time. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Alana. It's been a pleasure to be on your podcast. Awesome. Thanks so much. So that concludes today's episode with Tyrone Shum. I really hope you enjoy it. Tyrone provided a lot of valuable information that you can use if you have your own podcast. And I'm sure if you don't have one, it's definitely got you thinking about starting your own podcast. For more information on today's show and to download some of the resources and show notes, you can head over to talkingwebmarketing.com and navigate to this specific episode. Thanks for listening. You have been listening to the Talking Web Marketing Podcast. For more information or resources on today's episode, head on over to talkingwebmarketing.com.